Hello, the Inter-University Center for Terrorism Studies welcomes you to their conference entitled Post 9-11, 20 Years of Multilateral Counterterrorism Cooperation. Since 9-11, 2001, the terrorism landscape continues to cast a worrisome arc of instability and violence over many countries and regions in the world. Mindful that past and current security concerns require effective multilateral counterterrorism cooperation, this forum will focus on the lessons of these experiences for future best practice response strategies. Topics to be discussed by our distinguished speakers include increased international alliances with like-minded nations, as well as expanded efforts with international organizations and civil society leaders to counter and respond to the evolving terrorist threat. May I please introduce Professor Don Wallace. Welcome. And two days from now, we'll be celebrating the anniversary, the 20th anniversary of 9-11-2001, which seems long ago. <clears throat> you know, we hear a lot today about the need to focus on China and Russia, which of course we must, but the war against terrorism continues. Um, Yona will be introducing our very distinguished panel, uh, but before that, I'm going to call on Dr. Bust, but before that, I just want to say hello to General Gray. And having done that, Jennifer, the floor is yours. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. Um, on behalf of Potomac Institute, I want to welcome our distinguished panelists um, and our, our, all of our attendees today. Uh, as we reflect back on, on 20 years ago, um, even uh, thinking back on all the things that have happened in the last six weeks and reflecting how things have so dramatically changed in, in the way that the world um, we've lived our lives for the last 20 years and things changed so quickly overnight. Um, it's, it's sombering to, to reflect back on. So I don't want to start off on a, a negative tone so much. I think we've, we've made a lot of progress. Um, but I do want to give um, General Gray an opportunity to, to welcome on behalf of the Institute. And, and I know that today will provide a, a, a fruitful discussion. And yeah, well, just again, uh, thank you all very much. And uh, Don, it's good to see you again. I see you, sir. As usual, this will be one of your superb uh, uh, performances today, I'm sure. So with that, why don't we go ahead? Thank you both, uh, Professor Wallace and uh, Jennifer and General Gray. Uh, as always, uh, we academics, uh, we are grateful for your uh, inspiration and support of our work for many decades. Uh, what I, I would like to do, since we do have a very distinguished uh, panel, is to uh, uh, just uh, provide a personal footnote as a uh, participant observer related to the role of uh, international organization cooperation, particularly the UN and the UN family. On a, a personal note again, uh, going back actually uh, to the 1950s as a graduate um, student at the University of Chicago, I, I was uh, fortunate to meet at that time with Dr. Ralph Bunch at the United Nations. At that time, he was the Under Secretary uh, for Political Affairs at the United Nations, which uh, was the highest post ever held by an American uh, citizen at the time at the World Organization. I was uh, inspired uh, actually by his uh, vision of uh, humanity and combating uh, violence at the time. And uh, this, uh, this led to a number of years of work uh, at the UN at the time when uh, eventually I was uh, able to uh, publish uh, a book on the United Nations work on the economic and social uh, work of the UN in addition to the security military uh, challenges at the time. 
So this was published in 66. And then a number of years uh, later, I was uh, also privileged to have the support of an American ambassador to the United Nations at the time, uh, who was actually uh, at the Supreme Court previously, Justice Arthur Goldberg. And um, he guided me and also contributed to another volume that uh, was published, I think, in 1976. And we published this under the auspices of the Ralph Bunch Institute at the City University of New York. So again, uh, for me, um, the discussion today is quite emotional, recalling all the way back that the mission of the UN and multilateral organizations was to advance the cause of peace with uh, justice. Now, with that uh, footnote, I would like to introduce our distinguished uh, panel. Uh, according to the agenda, I, I hope you can see it on the screen somewhere. At any rate, uh, the first speaker will be Dr. Rafi Gregorian, who is deputy to the Undersecretary General and Director of the UN Office of Counterterrorism. And then um, we are going to have a video uh, presentation by General Wesley Clark, a former NATO Supreme Allied Commander. Um, he had to change his schedule at this time, but he joined us as you will see. Then the third speaker is Ambassador Stuart Eisenstadt, the former senior official with three US administrations and ambassador to the European Union. Uh, following that, we have Richard Rosson, who is currently Deputy Director of the Office of Multilateral Affairs, the Bureau of Counterterrorism at the U.S. Department of State. And last but not least, our colleague, Professor Rita Caldwell, distinguished professor at the University of Maryland, Johns Hopkins University, and a senior fellow at the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies. Uh, they have very distinguished backgrounds. We'll try to provide more information later on. But first, I, I would like to invite Dr. Rafi Gregorian to make uh, a presentation. Thank you, Professor Generals, uh, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I remember 9-11 in the way that many people remember the summer of 1939. It was one of the most beautiful days I can ever recall. Of course, what happened later that day, um, we all rem remember it in our own ways and, and probably have very clear lasting memories of it. But this Saturday marks the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. The time for remembrance and tribute to the victims, survivors, first responders, and all those who fight for a world free of terrorism. But it's also time for reflection about the international response to terrorism. As we grapple to understand what the current situation in Afghanistan means for our collective counterterrorism efforts, we need to assess what we have learned and what we should be doing differently. To help put things in perspective, let me start with a brief, admittedly somewhat simplistic overview of modern terrorism and how the United Nations has evolved over the last decades to address it. Let me rewind to the 60s and 70s for a moment. While the world had already, uh, had already seen primarily post-World War II insurgent groups use terrorist tactics as part of their campaigns, modern terrorism and terrorists were in popular conception Generally associated with those, uh, generally associated those terms were small radical groups, with no social media to amplify their message. Small groups of zealots would struggle to gain the public attention they sought for their cause, or to gain leverage against governments and societies they opposed. 
However, being the golden age of television and wire services, they could do something spectacular to grab the headlines, like hijack or blow up a plane or take hostages or conduct brazen assassinations of government officials. Indiscriminate mass killing was rarely the point of such terrorism. Rather, it was the psychology of the act itself and the attention it gained that was the point, or a more acute goal, such as the release of prisoners. Into the 1960s and 70s, many such terrorist acts were handled by national security forces and or those of a ruling, ruling colonial power. International responses, if any, were limited or marked by bilateral frictions between states in which terrorist attacks happened or who lost victims, and those which have, may have harbored or provided support to the attackers. However, truly international responses to terrorism began to emerge when such attacks started targeting either people entitled to a special protection in a foreign state, so-called internationally protected persons, or conveyances and activities that are regulated by international bodies, such as transnational flights and later airports and ships. International responses of the period were typically prompted by some specific terrorist act or acts, which attracted widespread condemnation and led to the adoption of international conventions of protocols. The first of these related to the prevention of hijacking of aircraft and the use of explosives against aircraft, but were soon followed by the 1973 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Crimes Against Internationally Protected Persons, and the even more specific 1979 Convention Against the Taking of Hostages, both of which resonated with the horror of the 1972 Munich Olympics massacre. Of course, things really started to change in the early 90s with the emergence of Al-Qaeda from the insurgency against the Soviet-backed regime in the 1980s. In August 1998, the group used truck bombs and near simultaneous detonations in what would be an Al-Qaeda signature and future attacks against the United States embassies in Kenya and Tanzania, killing 244 and wounding nearly 4,500 more. This marked a serious shift from the more calculated and targeted terrorism of the 60s, 70s, and 80s into the era of mass casualty attacks in which the psychology of the act, indeed often the very purpose of an attack, was to kill and maim the largest number of people possible. The embassy bombings prompted the Security Council to adopt Resolution 1267 the following year to create an international sanctions regime against Al Qaeda and the Taliban who harbored the group in Afghanistan. In terms of numbers then, the mass atrocity of 9-11 that we commemorate this Saturday took nearly 3,000 lives in a little more than an hour and wounded and sickened many more from more than 90 countries. It was not only the biggest single terrorist attack, but it made clear that despite whatever twisted philosophy lay behind it, mass casualties and sheer savagery had become the hallmark of 21st century terrorism, led first by Al Qaeda and then its Daesh offshoot. Even the United Nations itself became a target, starting with UN compounds in Baghdad in 2003, Algiers in 2007, Pakistan in 2009, Abuja in 2011. And more recently, peacekeepers in Mali and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, just to name a few. Only a few days after the 9-11 attacks, the Security Council unanimously adopted Resolution 1373, obliging all member states to criminalize terrorist activity, including financial support for the, uh, for the harboring of such activity. The Security Council then decided to form its Counterterrorism Committee, in part to help it assess member states' compliance with Security Council resolutions, with the support of an executive directorate, or CTED. By the way, the council will hold a session to mark the 20th anniversary of 1373 this coming Monday. The Security Council has since gone on to adopt a whole series of counterterrorism resolutions by consensus, finding unity on the issue of terrorism, even when it could not agree on how to address the conflicts in Syria and other places where Al-Qaeda and Daesh thrive. For example, Al-Qaeda's known interest in weapons of mass destruction led the council to adopt resolution 1540 in 2004. It obliges all member states to adopt legislation and other measures to prevent non-state actors from acquiring and using chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear material. The council created a group of experts and another committee to monitor its implementation. The General Assembly was also spurred to action after 9-11. On the fifth anniversary of the attacks, as the fifth anniversary attacks approached in 2006, it adopted by consensus of all member states 
the United Nations Global Counterterrorism Strategy, an important development considering member states still can't agree on a comprehensive convention on international terrorism and a definition thereof. Member states themselves are primarily responsible for implementing the Global Counterterrorism Strategy, but the UN organization also has a role in helping provide technical assistance and capacity building to states requesting help to implement its provisions on addressing the conditions conducive to the spread of terrorism, combating terrorism, and upholding human rights and the rule of law. The Secretary General created a counterterrorism implementation task force to coordinate the work of relevant UN entities involved in implementing the strategy and other related resolutions. Five years later, the General Assembly welcomed the establishment of the UN Counterterrorism Center, entrusted with promoting international counterterrorism cooperation and to support member states in implementing the GCTS. Established within the Department of Political Affairs, along with the CTITF office, UNCCT, as it's called, was given foundational financial contributions from the government of Saudi Arabia, which over the past 10 years has allowed the center to launch capacity building programs with seed funds to which other donors contribute or go on to fund themselves. Now, in light of what has happened in Afghanistan, I think it's worth mentioning just as a footnote here that also in 2011, after Osama bin Laden was killed, the Security Council decided to hive off the Taliban from the 1267 sanctions regime, keeping the original one on Al Qaeda, but adopting a separate one through Resolution 1988 for the Taliban, including provisions related for delisting sanctioned individuals who met certain criteria, indicating a renunciation of violence and commitment to the political processes set forth in the 2010 Kabul Conference and Consultative Peace Journal. As we've seen though, a number of these listed individuals now form part of the new Taliban cabinet. Back to the Security Council in 2014, when we see the adoption of Resolution 2178 in response to Daesh's seizure of Mosul and an unprecedented foreign terrorist fighter phenomenon in which more than 40,000 fighters from nearly 100 countries traveled to Syria and Iraq to join Daesh and other groups. This consensus chapter seven resolution obliges all member states to criminalize offenses related to the preparation, travel, and other preparatory acts undertaken for the purpose of committing terrorist offenses. As member states moved to implement its provisions, it contributed to stanching the flow of foreign terrorist fighters to the region. But the phenomenon remains a massive problem even after the territorial defeat of the so-called caliphate in March, 2019, as thousands still remain in the region, along with tens of thousands of associated family members, including many children born during the conflict, stranded in camps across Northeastern Syria. The council adopted a number of other resolutions related to Daesh as well, including 2199 on the preventing the sale of looted antiquities and oil, and 2396, which requires all member states to adopt and use passenger data systems in combination with biometrics and Interpol and other watch lists to screen for known and suspected terrorists, especially relocating foreign terrorist fighters. The UN also needed to adapt to the evolving methodologies of these groups. As an example, the extraordinary rise of global connectivity through social media platforms from the early 2010s onward saw a concurrent increase in sophistication and reach of terrorist use of internet for recruitment, particularly to reach otherwise marginalized communities while also glorifying its so-called successes. The emergence of such narratives in a large part contributed to efforts on the prevention of violent extremism, particularly the UN system-wide plan of action on the same, addressing the role of social media and terrorist narratives, closely followed by Security Council Resolution 2354, addressing the critical importance of counter narratives and the role of media in preventing and countering violent extremism. Similarly, the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, particularly UNSCR 2242, has addressed the evolving understanding of the terrorist threat by examining the gendered nature of terrorism and extremism while seeking to ensure the leadership and participation of women in national level plans for the prevention of violent extremism. By 2016, though, it was clear that member states needs to implement UN provisions to counter Daesh's as social media fuel global reach and the FTF phenomenon quickly exceeded the limits of UNCCT and CTITF as small parts of the Department of Political Affairs. 
Incoming Secretary General Guterres and member states saw the need to lift UNCCT and CTITF out of DPA and place it into a separate dedicated entity within the UN Secretariat. And so in 2017, the General Assembly agreed by consensus to the Secretary General's proposal to establish the UN Office of Counterterrorism headed by its own Under Secretary General. UNOCT was established to bring strategic leadership and coherence to counterterrorism policy. We help coordinate the United Nations system in its wide ranging efforts to prevent and counter terrorism and violent extremism. Additionally, in December 2018, the Secretary General set up the Global Counterterrorism Coordination Compact to replace the old CTITF. It is now the biggest coordination framework in the UN, includes 43 UN and other entities and organizations, such as Interpol and the World Customs Organization. Each entity brings its own expertise to various problem sets, and that allows us to coordinate activities across the United Nations human rights, peace and security, and development pillars in a truly holistic way. Actors like the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, UN Women, the UN Development Program, and the UN Office of Drugs and Crime all ensure a true one UN approach to counterterrorism aligned with the Secretary General's vision. For its own part, UNOCT has added to UNCCT's dynamic capacity building work, a portfolio of globally applied programs tailored for member states' specific needs. We're almost entirely funded by voluntary contributions from donor, state, donor states, principally Saudi Arabia and Qatar, but also an increasing proportion comes from some 30 other donors, including the United States, Russia, China, Japan, the European Union, and a number of its member states. Our Budapest-based counterterrorism travel program is a good example of one of our global programs. Working with CTED, UNODC, ICAO, and UN's Office of Information and Communications Technology, CTTP interweaves human rights compliance with advanced technology, with a multi-agency team that helps member states comply with UNSCR's 2396 and 2482. These require states to use advanced passenger information and passenger name record data in combination with biometrics and access to Interpol and other international and national watch lists. The program provides states the legislative assistance, technical training, and software needed to detect and interdict the travel of known suspected terrorists and other serious criminals in a way that still respects human rights with data and related privacy protection. It prevents it represents, sorry, the best example of a practical and effective multilateral response as a real, to a real terrorist threat that leverages member state sovereignty and territorial integrity while contributing to a network intended to defeat terrorist networks. It also demonstrates the strength of a cohesive coordinated UN response. Another example is our global program on countering the financing of terrorism launched last year. Together with CTED and UNODC, we assist member states to increase their national and regional capacities to counter the financing of terrorism in accordance with UNSCR 2462 and Financial Action Task Force recommendations. It includes new software being developed to help financial intelligence units deal with all sorts of terrorism financing, including on the dark web and with cryptocurrencies. A third signature program is our Global Victims of Terrorism Support Program. Promoting and protecting the voices and rights of victims of terrorism is a critical human rights priority for us and our partners. We work closely with victims associations around the world, of course, but we also have worked with UNODC and the Interparliamentary Union to develop model legal provisions states can use to implement General Assembly recommendations on protecting and upholding the rights of victims. On September 20th, we will have a joint event with the 9-11 Memorial and Museum to commemorate the victims from more than 90 countries from Paris to the 2001 attacks. And next year, we will hold the first ever Global Congress for Victims of Terrorism to provide a platform for victims' voices, but also for governments to learn about their special needs and challenges. Let me go back now to the bigger picture. Have we been successful? Are we better off now than 20 years ago? Three weeks ago, I would have said that globally, terrorist attacks and casualties are down compared to several years ago. Although this in no way is meant to diminish the suffering that still goes on in Afghanistan, Iraq, Mali, Nigeria, Somalia, Syria, and Yemen, nor does it ignore Daesh, metastasizing in Burkina Faso, Chad, Democratic Republic of Congo, Niger, and Mozambique. 
Moreover, the post 9-11 trend of authoritarian regimes and illiberal democracies using counterterrorism laws and provisions to oppress political rivals and opponents has only increased during the pandemic. Such actions not only violate political and civil rights, they also sow the seeds for future conflict. And as some studies have shown, can be the tipping point that pushes someone to adopt violence, including terrorism. Today, however, any answer to the question is clearly overshadowed by the recent developments in Afghanistan. Not only do they have dire consequences for the safety, security, and freedom of the people of Afghanistan, and of considerable concern the lives and livelihoods of women, but they may well result in terrorist attacks projected from or through Afghanistan. The terrorist threat that we have seen growing in other conflict zones, particularly in Africa, may well only become more acute as they seek to emulate the Taliban's takeover. We also have to remain particularly alert about the situation at the borders with Afghanistan's neighbors. The situation in Afghanistan has made it tragically clear that we need to do better to tailor our efforts to the special needs and contexts of each country to ensure national ownership and sustainability of their efforts and our efforts. Like map overlays that are used to plan a military campaign, when member states and their partners design counterterrorism campaigns, they must also think comprehensively of a country's or region's cultural, cyberspace, demographics, economy, history, language, religion, gender dynamics, and other factors as their own forms of terrain, which must be understood in order to maneuver effectively. We need to learn from the past and ensure that our efforts truly have a sustainable, long-lasting impact. Let me offer now just a few thoughts on what the next decade of multilateral counterterrorism should focus on. First, the international community must achieve more than just tactical wins against network terrorist archipelagos that fester and grow in areas of chronic conflict. We must play the long game with strategic responses driving towards durable political solutions. That is because while military action is often necessary against terrorist insurgencies, or as in the case of the French intervention in Mali, vital to stopping a terrorist takeover of a state, it has proven insufficient to defeating them. At best, it can achieve tactical victories or contain a problem for a certain period of time. International and partner forces can help keep terrorists off balance in conflict zones like Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Syria, and Yemen, but they do not in themselves generate the sort of political will or popular allegiance a government needs to make a country inhospitable to terrorist insurgencies. We need to go beyond this approach then to resolve conflicts and address the underlying conditions conducive to the spread of terrorism using all the political, developmental, and humanitarian tools at our disposal, including peace building in order to prevent violent extremism and terrorism. With respect to military efforts, my personal opinion is the greater unity of effort is needed by international security forces that are helping host countries battle terrorist insurgencies. Both the Sahel and the Lake Chad Basin are cases in point. Despite numerous international, regional, and bilateral interventions and deployments, the situation has gotten worse, not better. Is it really the best thing to have so many forces operating separately from each other and without any clear connection to a political strategy? Second, more needs to be done to help terrorist affected countries build relevant high impact capacity to address the threats they face. That is why we are starting to establish field-based program offices to deliver capacity building assistance that is closer to the beneficiaries so that it is both more impactful and sustainable. One example is our innovative behavioral insights hub in Doha, which is based on, advanced, uh, which is based on an advanced approach on prevention. Another example is our training center in Rabat, which will directly support requesting countries in Africa with the necessary level of specialization on counterterrorism. And that is why we are currently setting up a program office in Nairobi for East Africa for sustainable capacity building support on border security management, for example. Third and most important is that we must make the most of multilateral mechanisms to fight terror. Modern terrorists are learning and adaptive groups that exacerbate and exploit conflict and communal tensions. They are not only not constrained by borders, they use modern technology to reach global audiences whenever they want to. But whether they physically or virtually cross borders or send money, weapons, or messages from one country to another, that is precisely where sovereign member states acting in concert can be most effective. 
As General McChrystal once observed, it takes a network to defeat a network. That is why our CT travel, CFT, border security, interagency fusion cells, and strategic communications programs are effective and play to a state's strengths with its own networks, but also by linking to bilateral, regional, and international networks. It is why international legal cooperation on things such as battlefield evidence gathered by anti-DASH coalition partners and shared through Interpol can be game changers if they are used properly and in concert. I mentioned earlier the seventh review of the global counterterrorism strategy. The negotiations on this strategy were a delicate and sensitive political process as priorities between 193 member states differ widely. This year's was the most forward-looking review since the strategy was first adopted in, 20, in 2006. It includes 53 new paragraphs addressing today's most pressing issues on terrorism and violent extremism. For the first time, the strategy sets the ground to address the rise in terrorist attacks on the base of, quote, xenophobia, racism, and other forms of intolerance, or in the name of religion or belief, unquote. Yes, neo-Nazis and white supremacists are back. They have learned from Daesh and have international linkages with multiple nodes. Reaching consensus on action against this will prove to be essential for the adaptability and credibility of international counterterrorism efforts. With this resolution, the General Assembly also tackles the crucial need to counter the use of new technologies for terrorist purposes, such as artificial intelligence, 3D printing and drones, and the emerging use of new social media platforms, including gaming technologies, for recruitment. It makes a strong call for cooperative measures to stop the spread of terrorist content and hate speech online. There's also the delicate issue of repatriation of children with links to foreign terrorist fighters stranded in camps in Iraq and Syria that is now included on a case-by-case -case basis with the consent of requesting governments and parties. The protection of human rights and the rule of law has al always been a key tenet of the strategy but this review has gone a step further with meaningful advances on human rights, including gender equality, the rights of the child and victims of terrorism, civil society, and humanitarian action. It also includes groundbreaking language to ensure compliance with human rights and the rule of law. And this is probably the most important lesson from 20 years of counterterrorism. The failure to protect and promote human rights, especially human rights abuses committed by security forces, give terrorists recruitment tools for free. To conclude, the work of the United Nations is now more important than ever. As the terrorist threat has evolved, so have we, and we must continue to do so. The United Nations and its member states need to speak and act with one strong united voice and use all the tools at their disposal. The situation in Afghanistan requires the international community to further step up its work. Such work must be based on understanding of cultural ethos and on the ground realities the protection of innocent civilians and saving human lives must be our priority and humanitarian access must be guaranteed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gregorian, uh, for your presentation and for your service, not only at the United Nations, but the U.S. Uh, State Department, as well as at other areas uh, in the Balkans, uh, for example, uh, and uh, your work as an advisor to NATO uh, in that particular region. Uh, if I may, I would like to ask you a question that you refer to the uh, media, social media uh, issue as uh, all of us uh, know from our studies that uh, terrorists are not born, they are created by certain social, economic, political conditioning processes. My question to you is on the debate that is going on for many years, and particularly now, whether society at this stage uh, is involved in a clash of civilization or is it a question of the battle of ideas, which really means that we need long-term strategies uh, to deal with that, including uh, education? Well, uh, 
first of all, I, I don't know if I would categorize it as a clash of civilizations. If, if that was the case, we'd, ha we'd see a lot more conflict than we currently uh, are experiencing. I, I see these as reflections of trends of atomization of societies in which people are grappling to find a foothold and understand where they fit in. Um, and the way people receive and process information now is greatly altered from the way it was when I was growing up. You know, we had TV and a couple newspapers and there were like three channels on TV. You know, now it's, it's uh, you know, overwhelming amount of information, but it's, it's being strangely targeted through algorithms that most people don't understand and being pushed to people to reinforce, um, you know, their predilections, which is not a healthy thing to do. One of the things we look at in, in the field of prevention of violent extremism or countering violent extremism is to focus on critical thinking skills so that, that students gain the ability to determine the veracity of, uh, or reliability of the information that they're, they're processing and, and being fed. Um, but that is a, that is a society-wide uh, effort. And then of course, it doesn't help that we have social media um, platforms that tailor the information in a certain way. Uh, I think there's now a vigorous and healthy debate on these issues and how to, you know, ameliorate their worst tendencies. Um, I know in the case of the United States, there was several years ago what seemed to be a growing momentum towards uh, regulation in Congress about uh, uh, social media. Uh, places in other parts of the world, the European Union in particular, have taken that on and tried to strike the right balance between human rights and freedom of expression issues on the one hand and the security issues on the other. But it is, I, I don't think it's a clash of civilizations, but I do think, in addition to what I mentioned, it is the ability of very clever actors and, for example, ISIL or Daesh, using um, social media and other information technologies to identify those seams in society and, and rip them right open and accelerate them uh, uh, and use them for recruitment and, and other purposes. Over. Thank you very much. Uh, we would like to ask you if you have also a few moments to take one or two additional questions from the uh, panel as well as the uh, audience. Bob? Uh, Yona, we have no uh, questions thus far for um, the panelists. Okay. Anyone from the panel? So uh, if uh, you, you have uh, your schedule at this point and can stay for a while, uh, we will continue with our program. There is one question we just got submitted. Um, it's from the um, Spain. Um, Dr. Gregorian, thank you very much for your presentation. My question is how the women, peace and security agenda could be applied to the situation of women and children in Afghanistan under present circumstances? Well, in general terms, you know, the United Nations has been outspoken on the issue of, of the rights of of women and girls in Afghanistan. Uh, you can expect us to continue to be staunch supporters of that. Um, our ability to uh, undertake certain kinds of activities in Afghanistan is limited at present, and it's focused in the first instance on humanitarian. Um, but in that respect, women and girls access to education is very high on the agenda and will continue to continue to be so. But I think uh, as we come to grips with the implications of the Taliban takeover, in particular their interim government that they've announced, um, we also need to, need to pay careful attention to the women in peace and security agenda in the countries around Afghanistan to perhaps double down on, on efforts in those countries, uh, if you will. But also just more broadly, you know, we here in UNOCT are making sure that our pro all of our programming has gender uh, considerations mainstreamed into it, along with uh, human rights. Um, but at the moment, you know, as you can imagine, we, we can't do business with a regime that is half of its member, almost two thirds of its members are uh, sanctioned by the United Nations Security Council. 
So our ability to do anything inside Afghanistan is limited, but we should focus our resources and efforts on the surrounding area. Thank you again. Uh, if there are no uh, other questions at this point, uh, I would like to uh, move on to General Wesley Clark. Oh, who is uh, making now a video uh, presentation due to uh, reschedule uh, of his uh, time. So um, as uh, you know, uh, General Clark um, served the United States military for some uh, four decades, uh, also among his assignment, the commander of Southern Command and the Commandant of the European Command, Supreme uh, Allied Commander in Europe, and so on and so forth. So um, I, I would like to, to ask uh, Georgian to put on his presentation. Good afternoon, Yona and uh, distinguished panel. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to make a couple of remarks here in introduction. It is 9-11 week and of course we're looking back and we're looking forward and it's natural to ask how far have we come and are we working better together? The answer is of course, yes, we are working better together. We've created a complete set of defenses against terrorism. Um, they're technological, they're institutional, they're international. So on the technological side, we've got security cameras, airport screenings, uh, we've got watch lists, we've got digital identification, we've got facial recognition, um, we've got uh, institutions like the counterterrorism center set up, we've got NATO more engaged, we're working better internationally with our allies. Uh, we've, we've done a lot. This is not 2001. So I don't think we're as vulnerable to a terrorist strike as we were then, at least not a 9-11 style strike. It, it, it just wouldn't happen. We've moved a long way in terms of increasing the ability of governments, not only in the United States, but abroad, to know what their citizens are doing. In other words, if there is a trade-off between security and privacy, we've moved it uh, considerably in the direction of security and um, away from uh, the protection of privacy and individual liberties, which has its own dangers, obviously. But, um, but we're stronger. But there are some things that are cutting against us. Social networking provided a great opportunity for terrorists to recruit and also communicate privately. Cryptocurrencies, uh, a great opportunity for funding. And uh, the continuing struggle against the American dollar and the power of the U.S. Treasury uh, adds to that. Uh, uh, what we know from, from uh, our work in biology is that we're much more vulnerable to bioterrorism than we were before. Um, it's not just COVID, it's the ability to manufacture an agent that could uh, rip through societies with much greater lethality than what we've seen from COVID. And it may not be as widespread, but it might have a 50% mortality rate on it. And it would only have to affect a small portion and pandemonium would resume. And that work, you can be sure, is going on against us right now. And there's the whole realm of cyber threats. So we know that ransomware is out there. Uh, we know that our electricity grid's under attack. Um, but it could be done by terrorists. Now, here's the thing that's different. The most disturbing thing for me that's different is in 2001, we were the sole superpower. Uh, Russia was struggling. China was a pygmy. Uh, today, China is a behemoth, and Russia is uh, a nuclear modernized disruptive power in world affairs. Just remember, it was Russia that started the whole terrorism movement a century ago. Vladimir Lenin put it together. He built Comintern. And if you look at the 1960s and 70s, in the Middle East and in Europe, it was Russia, directly or indirectly behind all that terrorist activity. So we can't think that today in a multipolar era that terrorism is exclusively the province of the Islamist fundamentalists from, uh, from these ungoverned regions. It may be state-sponsored working through them. So as you do the discussions in the panel today, I hope you'll 
take advantage of this moment to think about the geostrategic context. Yes, we still have to defend against terrorists, but we also have to be more mindful than ever of the source of the terrorism, not just a religion, not just fundamentalists, but perhaps the malign design of a rival uh, superpower. So it's a new and challenging era. We've got to evolve with it to keep Americans and Western civilization alive and safe. Thank you, Yona, for the opportunity to introduce the panel. Thank you. Again, thank you very much uh, for this uh, presentation. We appreciate your uh, effort to provide the video. And uh, we would like to, to take your suggestions. Uh, we're going to uh, focus, hopefully, if uh, Ambassador Stuart Eisenstadt joined us, um, he can discuss uh, some of these issues. As uh, all of us know, uh, you um, had service for many years of three U.S. administrations, uh, senior positions uh, such as the White House domestic policy advisor to President Jimmy Carter and the U.S. ambassador to the European Union, other secretary of commerce, and so on. And uh, I, I think what is uh, really important that also your public service related to justice for the victims uh, of the Holocaust and other victims of uh, Nazi uh, tyranny during World War II. Uh, and now, um, if uh, you may uh, discuss some of uh, the issues that uh, you think are critical to consider at this time, and then we'll have a Q&A discussion. Thank you very much, Yonan. and it's a, a privilege to be with this distinguished panel. There has clearly been success over the last 20 years in dealing with the threat of terrorism. It comes from a global radical Islamic movement that does not have a central headquarters, but from disparate terrorist groups that share a common anti-Western theology and feed on each other's success from the Middle East to Africa and Asia. There's been no repeat of anything like 9-11 to our own homeland or that of our allies, but there are continuing threats. With the chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan and the rhetoric in the United States on both the right and the left of ending what are called forever wars, there's a real risk we will think the threats are behind us and we can go about business as usual. It's critical that we do not go from one end of the spectrum of major medical, military interventions, which have often been without understanding the countries or cultures in which we intervene, and without matching realistic policies with military force, to the other extreme of withdrawing from the anti-terrorism battlefield. We need the same long-term staying power as our adversaries. This requires bipartisan support, so our policy doesn't change with each election and the constant support of our allies in an anti-terrorism coalition with long-term staying power. And may I just say that I was really inspired by uh, Rafi Gregorian's uh, remarks about how the UN is in this for the long term. But for us, the Taliban knew they could wait us out. The slogan, you have the watch, we have the time. So for example, President Obama committed to the surge in troops in Afghanistan in 2009, but simultaneously set a public 2011 withdrawal deadline. What signal did that send? President Trump was rapidly drawing down troops and setting a May 1, 2021 deadline for withdrawal while negotiating with the Taliban behind the back of our Afghan allies. President Biden extended the deadline but again, set an arbitrary August 31 deadline that took the backbone out of the Afghan army. We should focus on some of the following broad goals with our allies and with the support of Congress 
the UN, and the American people. One prime goal is to prevent localized terrorist groups from acquiring weapons of mass destruction that would dramatically escalate the threat to the United States, our allies, and indeed the world. Another is to strengthen special military forces and CIA capabilities that can be deployed along with drone capabilities and recruitment of agencies on the ground to monitor and disrupt terrorist groups. So we don't look as if we have to have a 100,000 person military force. Third, it's imperative we develop our own over the horizon capabilities that in some way compensate in part for the loss of our military presence on the ground through cyber disruptions and wherever possible military bases to launch air actions. Moreover, we must recognize that corruption is one of the greatest barriers to our success in dealing with governments. Only a fraction of the hundreds of billions of dollars we invested in Afghanistan and got to its intended beneficiaries. And I've interviewed for a book I'm working on on the art of diplomacy, several people who work with NGOs and were doing wonderful work themselves, but couldn't scale it up. We should greatly improve our auditing capabilities so that we understand exactly where our taxpayers are going and that they're going to their intended beneficiaries. We often also don't understand the cultures, the history or the language of the nations in which we intervene to combat terrorist threats. And therefore the state and defense departments and our intelligence agencies should urgently build up the capabilities of our foreign service officers, our soldiers and intelligence agencies to become more proficient in Arabic and Farsi and in the country's histories and political dynamics of key countries. While there have been great strides in multilateral cooperation, as described by uh, Rafi Gregorian, this has not always translated into as much success as might have been expected. And one of the reasons I believe is the problem of inadequate intelligence, which I'll get to in a minute. But permit me to distinguish between different terrorist threats. One is state sponsorship of terrorist groups. Iran is the greatest state sponsor of terrorist groups, Hezbollah, Hamas, and its direct involvement through al Quds in Syria. Second, are state-supported havens for terrorist groups, Pakistan being a clear example. Despite seeming leverage with our large arms and aid programs, we could never put enough pressure on Pakistan through its own IC, ISI intelligence group to stop it supporting the Taliban. That really imperiled greatly our military abilities. Third are weak or failed states, which become sites for terrorist groups. This was the case with Afghanistan during the rule of the Taliban from 1996 to 2001. And now, as Rafi Gregorian has, has stated, in the post August 31, the Taliban, which we drove out in 9-11, remains allied with Al-Qaeda, and if its interim cabinet is to be taken seriously as the permanent cabinet, it will become a potential breeding gown for terrorists, ground zero. Syria with its civil war is another example of a weak state, which has become a site for terrorist groups. Then there are fourth non-terrorist groups like ISIS, Al-Qaeda, which are significantly self-sustaining. And here I get to intelligence for sound decision making, something that is wanting. In my personal experience, for example, with President Carter, it made it very difficult for him to make sound decisions on Iran. The intelligence on the state of the Shah was very poor. We didn't realize he had lost support of major elements of society. We didn't even know that he had life-threatening cancer affecting his decision-making. Nor do we have a clear understanding of the state of his military leaders 
until General Heiser's mission. We were surprised at the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, and I was present at Dover Air Force Base with Secretary Albright when the, the bodies of those killed in Tanzania and Kenya came back again. And our response there, I have to say frankly, was not up to uh, what it should have been in response. In Iraq, another example of inadequate intelligence, weapons of mass destruction. For the book I'm working on, I've interviewed scores of people. There was unanimity. This was not just a Rumsfeld-Cheney thing. Unanimity of all the major intelligence agencies in Germany, in France, in the UK, in the US, that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction. What none of them realized is that he had destroyed them all, but wouldn't admit it due to the fear of Iran and his own country. And here the UN inspectors, of course, uh, Blix and others were, were uh, not allowed in. And most recently with President Biden, while I frankly disagreed very strongly with his decision to pull out the 3,000 troops, I think we wouldn't have won the war with them, but we could have prevented a catastrophe. But in his defense, the intelligence agencies appear to have agreed that the Afghan army would have lasted many weeks, maybe even months. And this led to inadequate planning for the withdrawal. We often intervene also without understanding the nature of the countries. In Iraq, for example, we didn't appreciate what it would mean to remove a Sunni leader in a majority Shiite country. With Afghanistan, the Bonn Agreement, negotiated very expertly by my predecessor, Jim Dobbins, as U.S. Ambassador to the EU, tried to create a Western-style democracy for a decentralized and tribal society, and an Afghan army in our own image as a top-down uh, military. Now, the policy options quickly are as follows. First, diplomacy. We need to have allied and UN cooperation against state actors. Next, using the full resources of our trade and financial uh, capacities. And this means not just USAID, it means the force of the dollar, the Federal Reserve, it means the IMF, it means the World Bank, it means regional banks to try to target aid when necessary. Next are economic sanctions. I called myself the sanctions maestro in the Clinton administration. Uh, these are effective generally only against state actors. They can be helpful, but not decisive, and they have to be multilateral. They were very effective over time with apartheid in South Africa. In 2003, with Libya helped force Gaddafi to give up his nuclear program. In the Balkans, they were helpful in Bosnia and Kosovo, and ultimately in 2000, enforcing Milosevic's overthrow. In Iran, EU sanctions led to the November 2004 E3 agreement. One of the great tragedies is that the Bush administration didn't embrace that. When the EU joined our unilateral sanctions, later, closer to 2015, on oil, on the Iranian Central Bank, on swift clearances, this is what got Iran to the negotiating table in 2015. Next to covert actions, this is harder to do against non-state terrorists. We need more human resources, and we can see, however, efforts made to disrupt the Iran nuclear program through assassinations of the head of their nuclear effort and blowing up some of their key facilities and the tech Stuxnet uh, effort, presumably by Israel and the United States, to deal with their centrifuges. With military options, for state actors, we have to be very discerning of when the national interest is directly impacted. And then we need to match political goals with military action. We often don't plan before the military actions what will happen after them. If you contrast the Iraq War of 2003 with the Gulf War of, uh, of 1991, it's very evident there were limited political objectives in the Iraq war. There was UN Security Council resolution. There was congressional support. 
There were 30 countries that joined. And there was a very limited political objective just to get Saddam out of Kuwait. And indeed, George H.W. Bush was criticized. You've got Gaddafi by the neck. Why don't you choke him? And he said that would break the UN mandate, which was more limited, but it also would mean we would own Baghdad. Those lessons were totally forgotten in 2004. At the same time, ironically, that President Biden decided to pull all of our remaining troops out of Afghanistan, he decided wisely to keep 3,000 in Iraq. And that will help, I think, stabilize Iraq. We've had other examples of military action, the Israeli attack in 1981 against the Ozarek reactor in Iraq. But again, if you look at the Libya situation, uh, again, this is a perfect example of not thinking through the consequences. Yes, we got rid of Gaddafi, but we unleashed terrorist groups. We didn't have a plan in advance. What would it mean when the symbol, as awful as he may be, of statehood is removed? We simply don't make those cal calculations. We also have to know when we do military action, major military actions, there are going to be civilian casualties with drone and airport uh, airplane attacks. And we have to avoid trying to be seen as occupiers rather than liberators. We also need non-corrupt states to fight terrorists. And I would say to, to uh, Mr. Gregorian and others, we need to do more to fight corruption because corruption is in fact the enemy of our efforts. With respect to non-state terrorist groups on military action, we need special forces, we need the CIA, but we have to realize that in places like Gaza with Hamas, the Hezbollah in Lebanon, that terrorist groups often embed themselves with civilians, making more difficult air attacks. And last is nation building. Here again, we shouldn't go from pillar to post. It should not be written off if it's accompanied with security and anti-corruption measures to give it a chance to work. The people of Afghanistan indeed benefited from nation building in terms of GDP per capita, education levels, women's entrepreneurial activity, and some say under governments. And one last point, up to two weeks before our withdrawal, the Taliban had not captured one major city and kept it. And so, again, we need a smart strategy. We need a coordinated strategy. Uh, and uh, I think that it's very important that we distinguish again between different countries and the way in which we intervene with a haven for terrorism would be different than what we do for a country like Iran, which is an active supporter of terrorism. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, presentation um, and covering uh, a great deal of uh, areas to uh, consider um, as uh, we try to plan to look into the future and uh, in light of the lessons of 9-11. Uh, can I ask you a question if you uh, have time um, now, and perhaps a uh, few other uh, questions from our panel. Of course. So stay, okay, thank you very much. Uh, can you um, perhaps uh, make a comment related to uh, the role uh, of uh, the value system, particularly uh, democracy? Uh, can we um, try to develop a strategy to combine educational efforts, uh, the role of uh, religion, ecumenical approach to this problem, and the role of the media and the civil society? What role can they play now in this strategy? 
So first, let me say, Yona, that we have to be very humble about our capacity to impose our system on different societies. We have to understand that those societies are not necessarily uh, built with the institutions that we have to make democracy work. It doesn't mean at all that we withdraw from trying to build institutional capacities, but to try to impose our system on the others may be very difficult. So our political goals need to be very carefully planned to coordinate with our military action and with the type of country we're dealing with. So what would happen in Iraq, which by the way, was a central functioning state as awful as it was, with Afghanistan that was very decentralized would be very different. Uh, with respect to the role of social media, we have to have much more cooperation from Facebook, from others, uh, in terms of flagging uh, and blocking uh, terrorist sites. We have to have much more monitoring by our own intelligence agencies of that chatter that, which occurs uh, with the recruitment, which will clearly be enhanced by our withdrawal from Afghanistan. But again, I think the broader lesson is that military action does have a role when other features like diplomacy, like trade, uh, like economic sanctions don't do the job, but they should be applied with a scalpel and not a hammer, and they should be applied in ways that we think through the consequences politically of what we're trying to achieve and are geared to the nature of the country, its culture, and its language. And I would say, Richard, with you here, I'm, uh, I was a, a political appointee uh, and, and the Biden administration and served in a number of different capacities in that uh, respect. I have enormous, enormous respect for the career foreign service. I've worked in, in every agency in the government, directly or indirectly. No one uh, agency has that capability, but we don't put enough emphasis on building up our capacity in these countries. You know, we have this, I think, poor system of training people uh, in Latin America, and then they go there for a couple of years, they go to the uh, Virginia Training Center and they learn another language in Germany. We need to have people who are willing to focus full time on these areas of conflict, train them, and the same is true in our military, the same is true in our intelligence, to be real experts, to, uh, to speak the language, understand the culture, understand the history, understand the politics. Um, Ambassador uh, Eisenstadt, this is uh, Robert Sargent. We do have one question for you from uh, our uh, attendees. The question is, uh, let me ask you, uh, with whom do we have to press even fight in the future to weaken or wipe out uh, terrorism at large? The sponsors, as in the case of Taliban um, uh, in Afghanistan, were terrorists created by the mentioned sponsors? Well, we have to do all of the above. I mean, we have to be willing to try to build up the capacity of weak countries that can be repositories. We have to take firmer action against countries like Iran that are direct supporters. We've never figured out, Richard, how to deal with Pakistan. Uh, so we have to have a, a, a multifaceted uh, effort depending on whether the country is a direct sponsor, whether it's the host, uh, you know, the, the level of which it's supporting, or it, which may be the case in Afghanistan, Rafi, it may be that, that the Taliban for all of its uh, sort of pre-2001 members of the cabinet, may want to try to have a functioning state, but simply won't have the capacity to keep terrorists from using it as ground central. So we have to have very different strategies depending on the type of country that we're, that we're dealing with. Yeah, thank you. Any other uh, questions? Uh, no, Yona, not at this time. Okay. Um, we would like to proceed with our program and invite 
Richard Crossan, uh, who is Deputy Director of the Office of Multilateral Affairs at the Bureau of Counterterrorism, uh, to make his uh, presentation. Um, for transparency, I would like to uh, mention that uh, uh, Richard and I, we uh, uh, produced a study on, on NATO and um, we conducted some other uh, seminars uh, over the years. Richard, please. Thank you, Yona. First, a heartfelt thank you to you, Professor Alexander, for the invitation to join this discussion today and to such an esteemed uh, set of panelists and speakers for today. Before I begin, uh, please note that my remarks are considered off the record and the opinions and points expressed today are those of my own and do not necessarily reflect the views and policies of the United States government, the U.S. Department of State, or the Bureau of Counterterrorism. So again, thank you for the uh, opportunity to gather today to discuss uh, our multilateral efforts to address global terrorism-related threats and challenges. As Yona noted, I serve in the U.S. Department of State's Bureau for Counterterrorism, where I'm responsible for uh, helping to coordinate multilateral counterterrorism uh, engagement across the world, including uh, directly cooperating with Rafi and his team in New York. I'm uh, pleased to be here and uh, together with uh, fellow distinguished uh, speakers, critical partners in our collective efforts to fight terrorism and prevent violent extremism. Under the Biden-Harris administration, the United States is committed to multilateral engagement and working closely with multilateral organizations. Multilateral cooperation is the preferred and most effective method to address conflict, coordinate humanitarian responses, recognize and defend human rights, as many speakers have pointed out, and to prevent and count, confront terrorism while striving to build equitable systems of participation worldwide. Today, in my presentation, I'll briefly discuss my personal views and how the terrorist threat is evolving, share thoughts on progress made to date, and outline plans regarding how to best address this global challenge going forward. First, in terms of the terrorism landscape, we have collectively made progress countering Al-Qaeda and ISIS activities and dismantling, dismantling their networks, exemplified by the success and defeated ISIS so-called caliphate in March of 2019, that, as has been noted. On June 28th of this year, 83 members of the global coalition to defeat ISIS, including NATO, Interpol, and other international organizations, declared their joint determination to eliminate this global threat and pledged to strengthen cooperation to ensure that ISIS in Iraq and Syria and its networks around the world are unable to reconstitute any territorial enclave or continue to threaten our homeland's people and interests. However, the ISIS and Al-Qaeda threats continue, as others have said, to metastasize and evolve with the growing ISIS threat in Africa and Al-Qaeda's continued operations in Central Asia or through its proxies in East Africa and Southeast Asia. We must remain vigilant. Our sustained focus on these groups is needed to further disrupt recruitment, recruitment and plotting. We must also continue our collective efforts to prevent ISIS's resurgence and mitigate the threat posed by thousands of FTFs or foreign terrorist fighters and their associated family members who are detained in detention centers and displaced persons camps, as Rafi uh, has alluded to. To date, the United States has repaid 12 adult U.S. citizens and 16 U.S. citizen minors from Syria and Iraq. The United States also took custody of the two remaining Beatles in late 2020 and charged the British citizens for their crimes against U.S. citizens in the Syria-Iraq region. Alexander Cote pled guilty to all eight accounts in his indictment last week and faces life in prison without the possibility, possibility of parole when he receives his sentence in March of next year. He was involved in the kidnapping and murder of American journalists and aid workers, including James Foley, Stephen Saltloff, Peter Kossig, and Kayla Mueller, as well as British and Japanese nationals. El Shafi El Sheikh's case is pending 
in the Southern District of New York. We commend all countries that have repatriated their citizens, including Albania, Finland, Germany, Italy, and North Macedonia, and strongly encourage other countries to repatriate their citizens immediately. We support the United States, United Nations new global framework to aid the reintegration of individuals repatriated from Iraq and Syria and encourage others to do so as well. We focused intensively on building our partners' civilian counterterrorism capacities, particularly in employing law enforcement finishes such as investigating, arresting, prosecuting, and incarcerating terrorists. The State Department has also been working together with the Departments of Defense and Justice to build capacity to collect and use battlefield evidence in civilian criminal justice proceedings to increase the effectiveness of prosecutions. NATO, United Nations, Council of Europe, Interpol, and the European Union are all developing new guidelines and standard operating procedures to optimize the use of battlefield evidence in criminal proceedings. This capacity building has been critical in ensuring that FTFs, or foreign, foreign terrorist fighters, do not escape accountability for crimes they've committed in conflict zones. These tools have grown increasingly important as the terrorism threat grows more decentralized and moves away from traditional military zones such as Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria. We've seen the real world impact of these efforts in the Philippines, Bangladesh, Mali, Kenya, and Tunisia, inter alia, with our partners preventing terrorist attacks before they take place, responding to terrorist incidents more quickly and effectively, and holding terrorists to account while respecting the rule of law. Let me offer a few words on the current situation in Afghanistan. The scenes of families agonizing over an uncertain future is heart-wrenching for many of us who have worked over the years to improve the lives of Afghans, especially women and children. The United States government, or USG, has made clear to the Taliban that they will be held accountable if they fail to uphold their core commitments and responsibilities. One, continued movement out of Afghanistan of foreign nationals and Afghans who wish to depart. Two, full adherence to counterterrorism commitments Three, humanitarian access to all who need it. Four, respect for the human rights of all Afghans, including women and girls. And five, a peaceful transfer of power to an inclusive government with broad support. It is equally vital, it is equally vital for the Taliban to hear a united message from the world that it must respect human rights and deny safe haven to terrorists. The United States has been working hard to counter and prevent terrorist travel, including in the development of an adoption of a UNSCR 2396 in late 2017, again, as Rafi referred to. And this UNSCR imposed a range of new obligations on governments to, in response to the phenomenon of FTFs traveling to and from conflict zones. We have been and remain focused on ensuring that this landmark resolution is effectively implemented, including champion, including through championing strong ICAO international standards and recommended practices, leading global counterterrorism fora, forum or GCTF initiatives to develop watchlisting enterprises that are in accordance with each country's international legal obligations, including international human rights law as applicable, and prevent terrorist travel in the maritime domain, and providing direct capacity building to fund Interpol I-27, I-24-7 connectivity for many frontline states. I would also highlight that the United States is pleased to work with NATO on a whole of government project to build counterterrorism law enforcement capacity of NATO partner nations in the Middle East and North Africa. These combined approaches are essential to identify and address new and evolving threats. Let me turn to addressing uh, new challenges which Others have referred to uh, as white supremacist or uh, neo-Nazi terrorism. The U.S. government uses the term REMV, R-E-M-V-E, which stands for racially or ethnically motivated violent extremism. So confronting the terrorist threat posed by what the U.S. government refers to as REMV or REMV actors is another top priority for the U.S. administration and will remain so in the years ahead. The January 6th 
assault on the U.S. Capitol and tragic deaths and destruction that occurred underscored what we have long known, the rise of REMV, including the associated violent radicalization of white supremacist groups, is a serious and growing national security level threat. U.S.-based REMV actors have also been known to communicate with and travel abroad to engage in person with foreign REMV actors, pr primarily in Europe and in countries such as Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and South Africa. The USG is adapting its tool, existing tools and authorities to address this imminent transnational threat. On June 15th, the United States released the National Strategy for Countering Domestic Terrorism. While the focus of this strategy is on the domestic REMV threat in the United States, there is also a focus on the transnational linkages, especially the online connections between violent extremists in the United States and REMV actors around the world. Illustrating how seriously the USG takes REMV as a counterterrorism issue and challenge, in 2020, the State Department designated the Russian Imperial, Imperial Movement, or RIM, and three of its leaders as specially designated global terrorists. The first time the United States has sanctioned a white supremacist organization. RIM is a white supremacist group based in St. Petersburg that trained indiv individuals to commit terrorist acts. After the RIM designation, we engaged US-based technology companies, which sub subsequently chose to voluntarily remove RIM accounts and content from their platforms. And to Ambassador Eisenstadt, uh, Eisenstadt's point earlier, a RIM leader uh, recently pointed out to a, an American journalist that one of the most devastating impacts of the designation of RIM was that Facebook uh, shut down its webpage, which resulted in the loss of years worth of information and hampered the group's reach. Through multilateral efforts led by the United Nations, the Global Counterterrorism Forum, the Aqaba process led by the, the Kingdom of Jordan and regional organizations such as the OSCE, we are also leveraging our respective tools and capabilities against RAMV challenges. We supported the International Institute for Justice and the Rule of Law's Criminal Justice Practitioners Guide on addressing REMV, which includes good practices on the types and counterterrorism tools and legislation that countries should consider to effectively counter REMV threats and challenges. We also note that the United States has joined the Christchurch Call to Action, pledging with our member, uh, with other member governments and technology partners to work together while upholding the freedoms and protections of speech and associated uh, speech and association afforded by the U.S. Constitution, as well as reasonable expected expectations of privacy. Continuing to engage the tech sector to enhance info sharing, information sharing, and identify and counter often vague or coded language and symbols in terror and symbols in terrorist and violent extremist propaganda and messaging is also is also vitally important. In conclusion, by enhancing multilateral engagement, information sharing, and promoting a whole of government approach, we can together collectively and effectively work to confront these challenges to ensure a more stable and peaceful future. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Richard. Uh, I'm sure we will have some questions uh, for you. In the interest of time, I would like to move on to our next uh, speaker, Professor Rita Caldwell, and then we'll develop a discussion segment. So Professor Rita Caldwell, as um, many know, uh, you are a distinguished professor at the University of Maryland and Johns Hopkins, as we mentioned earlier, and a senior fellow at the Potomac uh, Institute. And uh, we would like to welcome you again to our discussion today and to focus on some of the lessons of 9-11. Thank you very much, Yona, for the kind introduction. And um, it's an honor to be on the panel with the distinguished uh, guest today. We were remembering 9-11, where we were when it occurred. I was in my office at the National Science Foundation 
on the 12th floor of a building about 10 minutes away from the Pentagon in um, Arlington, Virginia. I was conferring with some um, White House uh, staff about the budget for that year. When of course, the, this was nine, about 8.45 in the morning and our discussion was interrupted by my assistant who came in and said, there's been a plane that's crashed into the towers in New York. He flipped on the TV just in time to see the second plane crash into the towers. Now, there was no communication with the White House uh, for the next two hours. It wasn't until about 11, 30 in the morning that we were able, including the staffers who were in my office from the White House, to make connection. I think um, there are a couple of things I would like to, to share with you. Firstly, um, I was the first woman director for the National Science Foundation, but more importantly, I was the first microbiologist. There had been a biochemist, a biophysicist, uh, William McElroy, some many years earlier, but the directors of the NSF had been physicists, engineers, and um, predominantly from the so-called hard sciences. Um, may I have the uh, next slide? As General Clark emphasized, we, we really face bioterrorism threat of the homegrown variety. And I'd like to um, essentially walk you through what occurred post um, Twin Towers devastation in um, 2001. And that was a bio threat that was attributed to anthrax. It, it, um, it was carried out by a garden grown variety uh, of bioterrorism. It was not Al Qaeda as we thought initially. Now what happened was right after the first case was reported, I had been happening to um, be part of a group at the CIA um, really concerned about the potential of bio threats. And when the actual um, first case occurred, um, I made a phone call to Tony Fauci and without going into the details, which I've written in my book, simply to say that I served as the chair of an interagency coordinating committee on bioterrorism. One lesson to share is that this committee comprised about 16 representatives of agencies, um, including the NIH, the NSF, Department of Defense, Department of um, uh, Homeland Security, uh, et cetera. And we worked together for three years, meeting every Friday afternoon. And we were a coordinating group. We chose not to be official, which we could have had a presidential directive, but instead to work as colleagues of, eight, of representatives of all the agencies and to focus on it, advising the CIA and the FBI on anthrax. <clears throat> so let me point out that um, anthrax um, can be obtained by simply going out to your backyard. And if you are minimally trained in microbiology, perhaps even high school level, you can obtain a, a, a culture of anthrax. Next slide. <clears throat> the um, illness that comes with the infection depends on how the spores enter the body. Um, all types of anthrax 
can cause death if they're not treated. Uh, but you have the next slide. Really, the, um, uh, the kinds of anthrax, including cutaneous, which means you get a skin infection, or if you should somehow eat uh, meat that's not been properly cooked, uh, and the animal carried anthrax, you can have a gastrointestinal anthrax. Or unfortunately, uh, there has been case, there have been cases of those who uh, inject drugs um, can become in, uh, infected through um, the injectional route. But really, it's the inhalation of spores, which are the uh, dormant stage that you would find in soil or in an animal that's infected. And if it's inhaled, that then becomes fatal. We have the next slide. Next slide. The, um, wh why, would it, why am I emphasizing the anthrax? Well, it's because it's easily found in nature. It's a good weapon because you can release it quietly without anyone knowing. And these powders can be um, delivered as a powder, as a spray, as an aerosol in an airplane, which could inactivate an entire city uh, without being able to see or smell or taste them. Uh, it's been used as a, an effect, effective um, agent. We have the next slide. <clears throat> and so the anthrax drama of 2001 occurred with the letters being mailed. We didn't know that in September on the 18th. But in October, almost a month later, the reporter died in Florida <clears throat> from inhalation of the anthrax spores in the letter that had been sent to him. And then um, a few days later, anthrax were in the offices of um, American media um, when the FBI went in to investigate. And then by October 9, four or five days later, additional anthrax letters were mailed. By the 12th of October, <clears throat> 14 people had been infected, and three more people died from it, the inhalation of anthrax in New York, Washington, New Jersey. And then in November, a, a victim, an innocent victim, became the fifth person to die from inhalation, inhalation anthrax simply by posting, going to a post box in New Jersey. So you can see over this time period, and I'm sure you well remember the terror that this instigated in all of us uh, in the United States. Now the next slide, please. The investigation that uh, I chaired in advising um, the FBI who carried out the investigation with collaboration of the CIA was that first the uh, anthrax recovered from Mr. Stevens, the victim, the first victim from his spinal fluid. <clears throat> the DNA was extracted from that bacterium and it was sequenced and we compared the genome sequence to all the known references. And we had considered that this was really Al Qaeda. And of course, the CIA was preparing to collect soil samples from all around the world, which would have been a horrendous task. But we found that it was the sequence of an ancestral strain isolated in the United States and therefore, we turned our attention to a local um, bioterrorism incident. We have the next slide, please. The, anthra the, the reference strain uh, ancestor was a um, strain that had been isolated from a dead cow in Texas in 1981. It was mailed to the um, um, Port Dietrich in a container that was labeled um, 
Ames, but it wasn't from Ames, Iowa at all. That was simply a, an accidental naming of the strain. But we have to remember that in uh, 2001, we were just beginning the genome sequencing revolution. We had half a sequence of the anthrax, um, and we had a couple of other bacteria sequenced. The coordinating committee, again, without any officialdom, <laughs> we, we gathered our capabilities for funding the work. We funded um, we put through, through, through the agencies represented in the coordinating committee. We called ourselves the National Interagency Genome Sciences Coordinating Committee. Um, we transferred funds to the CDC so that they could sequence all of the, the uh, smallpox strains that were extant. And we, through NIH funding, we were able, and the National Science Foundation, we were able to get sequences of the anthrax um, uh, reference strains, as well as the strains that were being sent around um, through the mail. We have the next slide, please. Now, the perpetrator was a microbiologist, or at least the perpetrator we have concluded based on the evidence. And he was not trained genomically. And this is what anthrax looks like when grown in the laboratory. It turned out that this particular strain in the culture I'm showing you is actually from the Dr. Ivins's um, flask that he maintained in his laboratory. Now the next slide. It turned out it, they were different colony types, as I've just shown you. And these morphotypes, colony types, were in the spore preparations. And this turned out to be key in the investigation because it linked events in New York and Washington. But the perpetrator, not being a genomicist, I am certain, believed that he would never be detected because simply taking a Petri dish to court and um, showing the similarities would not be very convincing. However, next slide. What we were able to do in the three years was to take from the anthrax letters, grow out the spores, sequence them, detect that there were mutations and that in all of the labs that we had samples from, only one laboratory carried all of the mutations. And that laboratory came from Dr. Ivan's laboratory at Fort Detroit. We'll never know the details because Dr. Ivan's committed suicide the day he was arrested by the FBI. Now, I would like to use this example, which actually it took another three years before the report was released by the FBI. And now, of course, it's history. And um, Scott Jackson, who led the FBI uh, investigation, and I have been interviewed, and there'll be a podcast of about uh, eight half hour series of the investigation released in the near future. But what I'd like to do now is to provide some lessons that we should learn from this homegrown bio threat. First of all, we're in a highly polarized society. As General Clark said to us in the beginning of this discussion today, we can look to the local event potential of bioterrorist ter ter attack within the US 
caused by US agents, or I should say US, US individuals. So what, what must we learn from this? First of all, we do know that we are tremendously advanced in the 20 years um, since that first attack. We now, in the last year, we have learned what a bio threat can do to us because of COVID-19. But we have learned in this, in this past year, since January, February of 2020, we have, we have learned the sequence of the virus. We have been able to, um, because of about 20 years, of research on developing messenger RNA vaccines. That vaccine wasn't developed overnight. However, to give good credit, as has been done already today, to um, President Trump, who carried out the uh, rapid um, uh, allocation of funds to the pharmaceutical companies to produce massive amounts of the vaccine. We do owe a great deal to a woman scientist born in Eastern Europe, immigrated to the US, and was dedicated to the potential of messenger RNA as a source of vaccines, and therefore we had it ready. But then we went through warp speed to produce it, and that provided us with the vaccine that we, vaccines that we now have that are effective and that are protecting us. But I would like to point out that we have lost the capability of our public health capacity over the past 20, 30 years. And we really must rebuild our public health laboratories state by state that we had in the past. And in a report that I co-chaired for the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, we must, as we recommended in that report, have the capacity to do the science collect collectively, coordinatedly, by having chief scientists to governors of every state who could, under duress and under uh, the stress of, of an event to be able to coordinate um, and to, to collaborate. And I would also like to point out that we need to change the law, the federal law that will allow our federal agencies to share data, to work together, just as we did in this coordinating committee, which to avoid having to take minutes, to avoid being foiled, we worked collaboratively and very effectively in advising the FBI and the CIA in the science that led to detecting the source of the anthrax and uh, the perpetrator. So I, I think that we must be able to, to um, coordinate and to collaborate and to rebuild our national and our state public health capacities. Because there will be another perhaps COVID-20 or COVID-21, or there will be within the US another anthrax-like um, bioterrorism event. There's a whole litany of microorganisms, bacteria, viruses, fungus, that could be used. I won't go through them, simply to say that there is the potential for this kind of anthrax-like event to be um, put on us as a nation, and we need to be prepared. So I'd be very happy to take any questions, but that, I think, was the most powerful lesson um, that we have learned, driven home by COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rita, for your uh, presentation and recommendation. I would like to suggest that uh, we open up for some discussion. 
the clock is kicking, but at least um, our colleagues, uh, the speakers and the panel and the audience, are there any uh, questions at this time? Um, Yona, this is Bob. Uh, there's no uh, questions as of right now from the attendees. So if you'd like to have your um, internal discussions, that would be perfect. Thank you. Okay. Any of our panelists, speakers? Um, Dr. Gregorian has a question. Yeah, uh, Professor, I don't know if we're moving on to the general conversation now, uh, but I have I have two, I have three questions actually, one for Professor Caldwell, one for Mr. Pros, and one for Ambassador Eisenstadt. Is it, would it be yeah. permissible to, to yeah. do them in turn? Uh, yes. So maybe working backward and starting with Professor Caldwell, um, thank you for the presentation on, on anthrax. I'm curious, you know, it was, just about 20 years ago when, when U.S. forces went into Afghanistan and we discovered a lot of things that Al-Qaeda was up to. And one of them was that they had their own, what I would crudely be called a bio bioweapons research facility. I think they were looking into rice and, and other kinds of toxins. Um, how serious a threat do you think that was, if you're familiar with it? And as you mentioned, it's been 20 years since the anthrax scare. Are we better prepared uh, internationally, but nationally in the U.S. to handle a threat that would come from that kind of agent? Well, first of all, <clears throat> I did know one of the um, um, folks, one of the um, team that went in to investigate um, what was going on with respect to anthrax, and it turned out that um, the lab was fairly primitive and there was not evidence of the capacity to produce large amounts of it. Um, so we didn't know that though. Um, uh, we just knew that the individual who was running that laboratory had been brought in from another country, it was a native, um, and that there was the capacity uh, to at least initiate production of, of anthrax. But it was not essentially a, a, a real threat uh, based on their ability to deliver. Um, we, are, we are today able to identify uh, right away, which we couldn't do 20 years ago. Today we can identify in minutes, and, and I have been involved in, in doing some of this work myself, um, so that um, we would not be waiting for three years to come to the conclusion as you, as you also witnessed from, from, from the COVID-19 virus, it was sequenced within a few weeks. Uh, once uh, the sequence was released, we were then tracking it. And if we had been able to do the testing, we could have, I think, prevented much of uh, the expansion of the, of the COVID. But again, back to anthrax, it's still possible. It's still, it's still potentially a threat. Because we don't have the public health laboratories within each state that we used to have when I was a graduate student, we used to turn as a graduate student, I would turn to, to Baltimore, Maryland, because the public health lab there was, um, was able to provide all kinds of um, advice and, um, and assistance. We need to rebuild that in order to protect ourselves here in the United States. I, I hope that answers your question. It does very well, thank you. Uh, the second question was for Richard, and it's about uh, NATO, and which I know you have a long, long exposure to and work on. H how has NATO adapted in recent years to counterterrorism? You know, they've, they've talked about it for years, but what are they actually doing about it, if anything? Thanks for the question, Rafi. Yeah, the They've talked about it. Uh, NATO has, they had a military strategy sometime after 9-11 during the uh, first Obama administration, NATO took a military strategy and developed a counterterrorism policy uh, framework. And that was subsequently uh, used as a basis for the Trump administration's, uh, and it towards the end of the Obama administration, development of a NATO CT, action plans, so they kind of took the policy guidelines 
and uh, a set of uh, lines of effort in eight different categories and come up, came up with 40 some different action items. So NATO's done a lot and definitely more recently towards the end of the Obama administration and through the Trump administration on focusing on counterterrorism as international or fo focusing on terrorism as an international threat, uh, including um, through support uh, resolution uh, support mission as well, resolute support mission as well as uh, support in, in, uh, in Iraq and Iraq training of, of soldiers and contributions to the ISIS campaign. So there's a lot of things that NATO has done. Um, we'd like to see it do more. In fact, we're giving NATO a, a grant or a set of money to do some battlefield evidence training. So we're, we're putting money where, uh, where NATO hasn't necessarily got the common funding to, to, to do some of these issues or to do some capacity building. So we're, we're boosting that along. We hope that NATO will, uh, will partner with Interpol into developing and developing and implementing uh, some targeted training for battlefield evidence on kind of a whole of government approach. So that's what we're, we're focused on over the next six months. Thanks. That's great. There's probably uh, some, some collaboration there we might be able to do because battlefield evidence is a, a area that I think we'd like to exploit in, in the UN because we hear from a lot of member states say they don't know who these people are in Syria and so they won't take them back. But we know there's terabytes of information that the U.S. has pushed through Interpol to, that can help them with that. Thank you. And the last question, Ambassador, uh, is for you as your sanctions meister hat. Um, you, you gave a compelling example of, of sanctions or, or financial action bringing Iran to the table uh, for JCP, what led to JCPOA. How effective in your experience have been sanctions on non-state actor groups, terrorist groups like Al Qaeda and, and ISIL? Are we actually freezing uh, large amounts of, or meaningful amounts of money uh, by this pretty robust international structure of, of, of FATF and uh, CFT training and everything which the UN itself is also involved in. I'd be interested in your experience. Thank you. The answer uh, uh, is that our capacity to actually freeze uh, funds for terrorist groups is, is much more limited than it is for state actors. So, for example, we have frozen uh, about, uh, I think, seven to nine billion dollars of funds in the Federal Reserve uh, that would not be available to the Taliban unless they come up to certain standards we create. We can block IMF funding as well, but for actual non-state actors, they often use, for example, in in Iran and elsewhere, the, the Hawala uh, methods of transferring funds. And you talked about cryptocurrency, but this is a sort of non-technology uh, method. And it's very, very difficult to track that in an effective way and to really block their funding sources. So a lot of the funding sources do come indirectly from states. I mean, we know, for example, that ISI in Pakistan was providing aid and supper to the Taliban for years, decade for, you know, it, uh, almost from the time we thought we had wiped them out. So our, our capacity to actually get at funds of terrorist groups per se is limited, but to track that money back to state actors is something we need to improve. And then when we do, to have the leverage to, uh, which we did not have, didn't use properly in Pakistan to try to, to cut it off. Thank you very much. Uh, still, General Gray. Let me, uh, in a few minutes we have, let me thank uh, all the panelists uh, for what I think uh, was extremely good presentations covering a wide, uh, a wide spectrum, if you will, of the, uh, the uh, anti-terrorist and counter-terrorist challenges we face. I'd like to make a few comments. I, uh, First of all, to me, uh, terrorism is a tactic. It's been around a long time historically uh, by many different uh, countries uh, over the ages. It's something that, uh, that people do when they don't have very much of anything else or uh, in the case of uh, larger effective powers and uh, all of that, 
uh, sometimes in uh, seeking plausible deniability and all of that. But the point I want to make is, uh, I wonder if it's really correct to declare war on a tactic. Uh, more importantly, I think uh, there has to be a, a clear strategy in each country, uh, internationally, uh, big and uh, large countries, small countries, and all of that. Uh, I think through the UN and the, for the, uh, and the EU and, and other uh, facilities that, uh, that help coordinate matters internationally. But the point about strategy, all strategies have to be adaptive. And we seem to forget that from time to time. And we don't go back and, and adapt our strategy, modify it, change it, etc. So I would encourage uh, that kind of thought. I think that uh, I think that uh, the the uh, some countries that uh, that will use uh, terrorist type activities like uh, like for example uh, when uh, when we had the Beirut uh, bombing of our uh, Marine headquarters in 1983 uh, that of course as we all know was uh, conducted by the Hezbollah and so on in Iran however. Um, you know, there was a, a lot of money involved, and that came through Damascus, and the, uh, the uh, explosives that were used were the latest uh, fuel-enhanced Soviet explosives. That's what did the job, and it was the largest uh, non-nuclear explosion they ever had. Uh, the first, uh, the only other truck bomb was uh, in Afghanistan in 1972, that was a pickup truck. So I mean, the point I want to make is that was a major uh, operation involving uh, large countries, a lot of money, etc. I think that uh, I think we've gotten away. Uh, you know, when we started out after 9/11, and there were a lot of programs throughout the country. Here at Potomac Institute, we played a big role. Uh, uh, free, really, but we played a big role in, in developing the uh, command center in New York City, uh, so that it was much more flexible. And there was work done all around the country uh, with the, the former Secretary of the Navy, Richard Danzig, who largely through his uh, efforts, they formed a, 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 an anti-terrorist uh, uh, organization uh, within the Marine Corps that was a national uh, activity. And those activities were uh, further uh, conducted by each state at one point in time. We used to play war games on this topic all the time. And, and when you play war games and play the what if game, the principles have to play. The principles in industry, the principles in government, and the principles in uh, all around the, uh, you know, everywhere. And so, we were doing a lot of that. We were actually uh, paying a lot more attention, I think, uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the global terrorist challenge than we are today. Um, one thing that we did, uh, uh, and they did it very effectively uh, in commerce and, and in uh, other departments of the government, but we were, we were following the money. And that's very important. You need to know where the money's going and, and, and all that kind of thing, and learn to, uh, to follow that. So we, uh, I think we got to go back to uh, some of these uh, techniques and, uh, and uh, begin to, uh, to really uh, play this what if game uh, as a nation. Uh, our people ought to be trained on, uh, on uh, anti-terrorist type uh, activities, techniques, and so on uh, from the ground up. And then, of course, we should uh, uh, take our counterterrorism capability, which is, uh, is pretty good. And by the way, I, uh, I personally believe the intelligence community has been uh, superb throughout this whole thing. Uh, it's a very, uh, you know, it's uh, quite common to, uh, to criticize our intelligence community. And I'm not, uh, I'm not from that breed. I happen to believe that they have done... Uh, a lot of things very, very well, but we need to uh, we need to reemphasize uh, the whole uh, terrorist uh, uh, situation and the like, and become uh, much more involved again, like we were 
after 9-11. And that's really uh, all the comments I have. Again, I want to thank everybody. And uh, I guess uh, I guess my, my good friend, the Army General, is not on the line, but it's good to see him again. Uh, I haven't seen him in quite a while. So thank you all very, very much. I do like to add one thing, if I could, on the money. Mm -hmm. When I was Deputy Secretary of the Treasury in the Clinton administration, uh, we helped develop uh, an international effort uh, became known as anti-money laundering, anti-know-your-customer, uh, and so forth. But it was also aimed at terrorist financing. Uh, and then my successor uh, did a very good job uh, of having a formal position created as Under Secretary, uh, Deputy Secretary of Treasury for counter-terrorist uh, financing. So our banks and financial institutions are much more alert to being used as transfer agents for terrorist financing than they had been before. Well, we, we've come a long way. There's no question about that. I can remember back when, uh, when they first started with the counter-terrorist activities and like in the military. And of course, the big challenge then was uh, aircraft. Uh, aircraft being uh, captured by others and so on, and of course we've uh, we've come a long way from that. But it's a, it's a, when you really look back at, historically at, at the counterterrorist uh, activities and and what we've uh, done and what we've learned, it's a it's a tremendous amount, and uh, a lot of it is very technical and so on and the like. But we uh, we've done some awfully good work, and it's. Uh, it would be, I think, uh, timely uh, to go back and review a lot of that kind of thing and see just uh, what we can do today to, uh, to be more uh, prepared. There's no question that, uh, for example, if we, if we had, a, uh, if we had a, uh, a problem with a grid in New England and, a, uh, and an introduction, uh, a... Uh, some kind of nuclear device in New York City, and perhaps a bio, uh, one of uh, Rita's uh, projects uh, used in uh, Washington, D.C. I mean, the panic, uh, the potential panic in America would be incredible if we're not careful. So we, we need to go back and we need to play this game a little bit. We need to play the what if game, and we need to, we need to get people more involved in uh, in protecting our great nation. Professor Wallace. I think Al Gray should have the last word. So General, thank you very much. And Yara, thank you. Okay.